Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Senators, I rise today to speak to Bill C-71, an act to amend certain acts and regulations in relation to firearms. I will speak in support of Bill C-71, not because I think it is the best legislative response to effectively address public health concerns regarding firearm deaths, but because it is a small, and in my opinion, a rather hesitant step towards improving the safety of Canadians. My speech will be guided by both my professional and personal experience. I will focus on the relationship between guns and suicide, a very important concern that, in my opinion, could have been more fully explored during the committee study of this bill. It is a relationship that is not well understood by many Canadians. I would guess that every member in this chamber has been affected by suicide in some way. And I recognize that my remarks may return painful memories. I wish this was not the case. I have spent my professional life dedicated to the improvement of mental health and the treatment of mental illness. In that vocation, I became only too aware of the tragic consequences of suicide. Tragic for parents, family members, friends and communities. That professional exposure, however, paled in comparison to my personal experience with suicide. My beloved uncle, an accomplished and very successful banker, father to two amazing children, enjoying a loving marriage, who as a teenager had survived the chaos of World War II, took his own life. Nobody who knew him would have ever predicted he would die the way he did. I am certain that if a fortune teller had told him that his fate was suicide, he and everyone he knew would have thought that the soothsayer was off course. Like other families, we were left with the question of why, with no clear or satisfactory answer. As a psychiatrist, I've made the study and application of suicide prevention an essential part of my research and clinical work. I'd like to share with you my understanding of the potential impact of Bill C-71 on death from gun-related suicide through my professional lens informed by my personal experience. Suicides account for 75% of all gun deaths in this country. From 2000 to 2016, suicide accounted for almost 10,000 out of the 12,692 gun deaths in Canada. Our biggest challenge in gun-related death in Canada is not gun homicide. Our biggest challenge is gun suicide. A suicide attempt is a behavior chosen to result in death. However, many Canadians may not know that most suicide attempts do not result in death. Indeed, about 90% of people who attempt to suicide do not actually die by suicide. This is both startling and extremely important. It raises a vital question. What differentiates those who attempt suicide and do not die from those who attempt suicide and die? The difference is primarily due to the lethality of the method used. The more lethal the method, the more likely will death be the result. Guns are very effective killing instruments. Less than 5% of suicide attempts involve guns. However, about 30% of all suicide deaths result from guns. If a person uses a gun in their attempt, they will likely die. It is also important to understand that suicide attempts are often impulsive. The human brain's control of behavior is complex, but generally involves two decision-making systems. One reacts rapidly to a thought or event, and one reacts more slowly. The first leads to impulsive behavior, the second to reflective behavior. Usually, the reflective component is able to override the impulsive component. 
Sometimes, usually in the context of extreme emotional strains, such as depression, diminished cognitive capacity, such as psychotic thinking, or substance use, such as alcohol and drugs, this modulation does not occur. Impulsive behavior, such as a suicide attempt, is the result. This is called a suicide crisis. Evidence shows us that on average, about half of all suicide attempts are impulsive. About 25% occur within five minutes of the initial thought. About 70% occur within one hour of the initial thought. The onset of a suicide crisis is often immediately followed by a suicide attempt. This is why lethality matters. If a gun is available during the suicide crisis, the impulsive action that occurs leaves no time for reflection. The gun is used and death is the likely outcome. If a gun is not available and another method is chosen, for example, taking pills, death is not the likely outcome. About 5% of deaths from gun suicide occur in homes where no gun is present. In contrast, almost 80% of deaths from gun suicide occur in homes where a gun is present. It is living in a home that has a gun, not owning a gun, that is the issue. Indeed, it is a family member, including a child of a gun owner, that can take their own life. And as I have shared with you in my uncle's story, it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to predict who in your family will take their life, and if so, when. In my professional life, whenever I was conducting a suicide risk assessment, I always asked about the presence of guns in the home. Often this question raised a concern that parents had not considered. Loving, caring parents, people who wanted their child to live and flourish, had not made the connection between having a gun in the house and the increased risk of death for their child. This possibility had never crossed their minds. They were not aware of the relationship between guns and death by suicide. Globally, the weight of the best available scientific evidence demonstrates a common conclusion. Interventions such as improvement of oversight and regulation of guns save lives. These findings have been reported over and over again in studies from many different jurisdictions using a number of different research designs. Interventions that control access to guns, including background checks, such as the PEER and C-71, and more substantial regulations related to the use of guns are associated with lower suicide rates. And it is also clear that substitution of method leading to similar death rates does not occur. If access to the most lethal means of suicide is made more difficult, lives are saved. It is clear that the extensive weight of best available evidence shows that there is a relationship between guns and suicide and that better oversight of firearms results in significantly lower firearm suicide rates as well as the proportion of suicides resulting from firearms. It is therefore reasonable for us to see Bill C-71 as a step forward to improving the safety of Canadians seen through the lens of the relationship between guns and suicide, even though this bill is only a small step in that direction. There are many ways we can improve our oversight of firearms to help lower rates of gun-caused suicide, and by so doing, lower overall rates of suicide. One of these is through thoughtful regulation. In particular, at this time, I would like to propose two suggestions that I think might make a difference moving forward. They're based on my professional experience as well as my study of guns and suicide. In addition to better oversight of guns, better information about how to decrease suicide risk provided to gun owners may help prevent gun suicide. 
In my opinion, it's imperative that information about suicide risk and guns be made available to all gun owners. My first suggestion focuses on the position, possession and acquisition license, the PAL process. To acquire a license, a potential gun owner currently is required to learn about a number of topics that include operating a firearm, physical parts of a firearm, how to use a firearm, responsibilities of a firearm owner, amongst other things. Nowhere on this list is found understanding of suicide prevention as it relates to guns. I believe that this is a missed opportunity to put into place a simple intervention that may save lives. Therefore, I would suggest that the PAL education and training course be modified to include information on the relationship between guns and suicide and information on how to identify and assist a person who is suicidal. Second, I would suggest that whenever ownership of a weapon is transferred, the transferee be obligated to provide specific information about the increased risk of death from suicide associated with gun ownership. This would also include information... I apologize for interrupting you, but it's uh, now 6 p.m. and pursuant to Rule 3-3 sub 1, I'm required to leave the chair unless it's agreed that we not see the clock. Is it agreed, Honorable Senators? Agreed. Agreed. Senator Kushner. Thank you. <clears throat> These are both suggestions that could potentially reduce gun-related suicide. To my surprise, after I had come up with this idea, my staff discovered that it was not novel. It exists already and has achieved some traction through grassroots movements in the United States of America. In Colorado, the CO Gun Shop Project works with retailers, range owners, and safety course instructors to add suicide prevention information. New Hampshire also has a similar project that shares materials developed by and for firearm retailers and range owners on the ways they can help prevent gun-related suicide. Reducing risk of harm through education and legislation is a proven method for increasing safety of our citizens. Honorable Senators, whatever our own personal relationship with guns is, we need to use our knowledge about the relationship between guns and suicide to help guide us in our current deliberations. And we need to think proportionally and compassionately when considering how to best discharge this duty. We also need to reflect on our own experience with the tragedy of suicide and use that experience to help us guide our decision making. Suicide is a significant public health concern. It is known in every community and has touched the lives of many people. We need to help reduce rates of suicide and this includes better oversight of guns. In my opinion, Bill C-71 can be part of that larger dialogue that needs to happen in this country. It is not all that needs to be done, but it needs done. It's an attempt to move towards a safer Canada, and honorable senators, that is what we as legislators must consider as part of the duty to, of a government to ensure the safety of its citizens. Please join me in this work by voting to support C-71. Thank you.